President Obama this weekend continuing to make the case striking Syria is in our national security. Against opposition not only from Republicans, but also Democrats like Senator Tom Udall. And it's time now for our Sunday group. Britt Hume, Fox News senior political analyst. Howard Kurtz, Fox News media analyst and host of the new show Media Buzz, which debuts today on Fox News Channel. GOP mastermind Carl Rove, <laughs> I love saying that, and Fox News political analyst Juan Williams. So, Britt, how did we get here where the president has been turned down by the rest of the world, is in an enormous hole, 10 to 1 against him, in the, at least the House on Capitol Hill, and he's counting on one speech to turn everything around? Well, the sad thing for him, Chris, is that these presidential speeches are a depreciating asset from the moment a president takes office. They're powerful instruments. He can command an enormous audience and get the networks to carry it and so on. But over time, we've seen this with president after president. I can remember going back to Lyndon Johnson on Vietnam. Over time, their effectiveness diminishes. And the question for him right now is not whether he has the votes or can get... The question is whether he's halted the stampede, which is what happened. After he announced this, my initial thought was, He's likely to get this. Presidents usually do on the great big votes. Um, but what happened to some extent in the Senate and to a much greater extent in the House was just an absolute rush for the exits. Nobody seems to want this. The constituent phone calls that you suggested earlier are piling up against it in overwhelming numbers, no. And uh, this, is, this is a really heavy lift. It's not at all clear at this point that it can be done. You know, Howie, it was interesting because Dennis McDonough said, look, people believe the intelligence. The question is whether they think we need, should, should go to war over this attack. And the answer, and we, the president's been making the case why it's in our interest to go to war, the answer so far from voters and from the folks up on Capitol Hill is no. I mean, they seem to know the stakes. And so I guess I wonder is what can the president possibly say, because he's been making the argument for two weeks, that will change that equation. Well, clearly the turning point will be when you sit down with President Obama tomorrow <laughs> at the White House and maybe the five other network anchors as well. Uh, this is a full court press, obviously, the big speech. But I agree with Britt in that big speeches rarely move public opinion on something as profound as this. There is just deep resistance in this country to another Mideast military entanglement. Uh, and that's reflected by the fact that by Republican lawmakers who don't much like Barack Obama and Democratic lawmakers who don't much like war. And I don't see how a single speech uh, changes that. The president is in a box of his own making because he uh, asked for congressional approval. And also, the shadow of Iraq, the long, dark shadow of Iraq hangs over this, especially for Democratic politicians who voted for the intervention under your administration, George W. Bush administration, and felt burned by what happened. I want to pick up on that with you, Carl, because you have been involved in, in helping a White House orchestrate the run-up to two wars. And I know some of the folks watching today are going to say, hey, look, remember what happened in Iraq where the Bush administration took us to war based on information, intelligence that was widely believed but that turned out to be false. I have a couple of questions. First of all, how much do you think the Iraq experience has soured this country against any military involvement? Well, uh, take a look at what happened in Libya. Before President Obama acted in Libya in 2011, uh, the American people were opposed to military action by 35 to 60. After he took action, they were in support of a 54-43. So uh, the American people do have an animus against any kind of action, but if you take action and you're successful, they applauded pre what President Obama did in, in Iraq. I think there's something more fundamental here. The president has two sets of issues with members of Congress. And I've spent the last 10 days talking to a lot of mem Republican members, particularly in the House. One basket of issues are particular issues. Is there a national security interest in the United States at stake? Uh, will we be strengthening, will we get something worse afterwards? Will we be, you know, in essence, cooperating with Al Qaeda, as Rand Paul says? And third, uh, what kind of uh, implications will there be for broader U.S. interest in the region after it's over? But you can talk through all three of those issues with members of Congress and come to a place where they could be supportive of the president. But there's another more deeper problem, which is they fundamentally don't trust the president. I've been taken aback by how much they in, simply do not trust him. Now, this is a bipartisan problem because the, for the president because it's not just Republicans who distrust him. It's Democrats who are unwilling to be led by him. And not just the, you know, sort of the fringe players like Alan uh, Grayson of Florida. I mean, we're talking about... You know, Udall of Colorado, a sensible, uh, reasonably moderate, uh, you know, very popular back home. He could withstand this vote, but he's not going to go with the president. And it's a sign of the, the bad relationship the president has with Republicans and Democrats in Congress that he has not been able to rally more support. Why? 
Well, I think the ghost of Vietnam <laughs> and, and what happened in Iraq still haunt this administration. But I think it's very clear that what the president has to say is, look, there have been three times in history that we've seen chemical weapons used, and it's, you know, Hitler, uh, you know, you move forward Saddam from Hitler Hussein. to Saddam Hussein, and then you come to Bashar al-Assad. And you've got to say there's the potential here for international anarchy if the U.S. does not act, and that constitutes a vital U.S. interest going forward. We do not want this. We do not want to send this signal to North Korea. We don't, don't want to send this signal to the folks in Iran, and we definitely do not want to have uh, Assad American think people, that he can shoot at Israel. The American people, weapons. according to the polls, and Congress, according to the vote count, I mean, the president has made that very clear. They don't buy that. No, I think that he has not made it sufficiently clear. I mean, the previous time the president spoke on this issue was over the Labor Day weekend. I think he has the opportunity now to sit down and say, look, we're not the world's policemen. This will not be Afghanistan. It's not going to be Iraq. But this is a crisis, and now we have to act as a fireman because the world's on fire, and if we don't act now, there will be terrible consequences for us down the line. Fred, I want to bring you in and, and in your answer also address this thing I thought quite interesting. Kerry now today suggested that the U.S. may consider going back to the Security Council because that's what the Europeans are, are saying. Let's go back and find out what the Security Council weapons inspectors well, find. Some countries are saying that they don't want to do anything. They might or might not support this. They, they don't want to do anything until this uh, UN report uh, from the weapons inspectors is done. The problem with that, of course, is the weapons inspectors are merely to ascertain whether, in fact, chemical weapons were used and will make no determination about who used them. And while Dennis McDonough may argue and others agree with him that there's no uh, doubting the intelligence on this, the fact is there are a lot of people in this country who do, and I suspect there are a lot of people in other countries, conspiracy-minded people, and there are lots of them, who, who wonder who actually who used them. So I don't, it's not clear to me that, that waiting for the U.N. is going to do any good, but I think John Kerry is trying to do everything he can to try to get people on board. The French are our, look like our, uh, our most steadfast ally in this. Uh, helps, of course, that Kerry speaks good French, I guess. He's, <laughs> he's proud of it. He's got a very good accent. Yeah, I listened very to him good, yesterday. Very good indeed. Very good. So, uh, you know, I would, I would say that he's doing what he can, but I, I'm not sure this U.N. report is going to help and that it would move any members of the Security Council to change their votes, principally China and Russia. I, I, Carl, I want to go back to you in the little bit of time we have left, because you were talking about, you know, they were opposed to Libya, then the president acted and they supported it. Did the president make what could be a tremendous mistake, taking us up to the edge of war and then backing down? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, look, I support the president's action. I, I early on made it clear whether it helped him or hurt him that I thought he was doing the right thing. And I, and I thought that he needed to take it to Congress, but in retrospect, that was a mistake because he got right up to the edge and then on Friday has the 45-minute walk and pulls back and heads off to, to the G20, heads off to Sweden and the G20. And the energy behind it dissipated. The president probably should have been better to take an action. Uh, we now have the Syrians uh, with how, God knows how many days or weeks, if the United States does take action, to disperse all of these units, to, to you know, protect themselves as much as possible, build human shields. Uh, this is an unmitigated disaster. It's an amateur hour at the White House. And, you know, we mentioned earlier the, 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 the Secretary of State. We also have the problem of the political advisors around the president signaling that they're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to jam Congress. David uh, Axelrod tweets out, uh, uh, Congress is now the dog that, that caught the car. We have an unnamed White House official saying we don't want the Congress to be able to have its cake and eat it too. This, this is poisoning the relationship the president has with Congress, and he needs to have a good one to get this resolution oh. through.